Hi everyone! Today we're going to be talking about Chapter 3 of Biochemistry for the MCAT, which covers non-enzymatic protein function and protein analysis. Chapter 3.1 is about the different classes of proteins that are involved in cellular function. Structural proteins are proteins that make up the cytoskeleton and support the overall shape and structure of the cell. The first type of structural protein is collagen, and collagen makes up the extracellular matrix of our connective tissue, and it offers our connective tissue strength and flexibility. Elastin is another protein that's found in the extracellular matrix of connective tissue, but elastin offers stretch and recoil properties. It's really easy to remember what elastin does because it's much like an elastic. It allows things to stretch and then bounce back. Keratin is a protein that makes up the intermediate filaments of our epithelial tissue. Actin makes up the microfilaments and thin filaments, and tubulin makes up the microtubules. Here, I've attached a photo of microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments, and these are the three components of our cytoskeleton. So microtubules are made out of repeating subunits of tubulin, microfilaments are made up of repeating subunits of actin, and intermediate filaments are made up of repeating subunits of usually keratin, but sometimes other proteins as well. So these repeating subunits are called motifs, and an important property of tubulin and actin is that they have a negative and positive end, so motor proteins can travel on them with directionality. Motor proteins are also known as ATPases because they require ATPs in order to move their cargo. The first type of motor protein is called myosin, and myosin is a motor protein that interacts with actin. Kinesin and dynin are similar to myosin, but they move on microtubules. Kinesin moves toward the positive end of a microtubule, and dynin moves toward the negative end of a microtubule. Kinesin and dynin are also involved in the movement of cilia and flagella, as well as the contraction of the cell during anaphase. Here I've attached a picture of what a motor protein would look like in the cell. And here, your motor protein is walking on part of your cytoskeleton, either actin or tubulin. Binding proteins are proteins that, um, the job of binding proteins is to bind a single molecule. For example, hemoglobin binds oxygen and, and carries oxygen throughout our blood, and calcium binding proteins bind calcium and carry them to their destination. Cell adhesion molecules are a class of proteins that are found on the surface of most cells and they help in binding the cell to the extracellular matrix or to other cells. We'll talk about the three major classes of cell adhesion molecules, but all of them are integral membrane proteins, which means that they're embedded in the membrane. The first class are called cadherins, and these are glycoproteins that mediate calcium-dependent cell adhesion. Cadherins almost always attach similar cell types together, so they attach epithelial cells to epithelial cells and nerve cells to nerve cells. There are different types of cadherins for different types of cells. For example, the cadherin used for epithelial cells are called E-cadherin, and for nerve cells they're called N-cadherin. Integrins have two membrane-spanning chains, and these are known as alpha and beta. These chains are really important to communicating with the extracellular matrix. Selectins bind to carbohydrates on other cells. This is really important for white blood cell migration because white blood cells have unique carbohydrates on their surface. Selectins form the weakest cell adhesion molecule bonds of the three classes that we talked about. Immunoglobins are also known as antibodies, and these are really important in your immune system. Immunoglobins are made up of two identical heavy chains, shown here in purple, and two identical light chains, shown here in blue. These heavy chains are connected to each other through disulfide bonds, all along where I'm pointing at now, and disulfide bonds here, connecting the light and heavy chains together. Immunoglobins have at the tips of their Y shape this region called an antigen binding region, and this is the region that senses the antigen or the foreign invader. There are three options once an immunoglobin or an antibody senses an antigen. The first is neutralization, which means that they neutralize the threat and it's no longer a threat. The second is marking for destruction, 
and this is called opsonization. So when they mark an antigen for destruction, a different type of cell comes and um, digests or breaks apart the antigen. The third option is that the antibody can clump together with the antigen to form an insoluble mass, and this will precipitate out and will be digested by a different type of cell. This is called agglutinating. Chapter 3.2 is about biosignaling, which is the process that cells use in order to detect and respond to signals. The plasma membrane only allows small, uncharged molecules to pass through. Therefore, ion channels are proteins that are necessary in order to allow bigger and charged molecules into and out of the cell. Ion channels are involved in a process called facilitated diffusion, which is a passive transport mechanism, which means that energy or ATP is not necessary to make the transport happen. This type of transport goes down the concentration gradient, which means that the molecules must flow from an area of high concentration to low concentration. Ungated ion channels are unregulated, which means that ions are allowed to flow through until an equilibrium is reached. Voltage-gated ion channels are ion channels that only open when a certain voltage is reached. For example, voltage-gated ion channels are very common in neurons. And here you can see a diagram of an action potential. So when a certain threshold voltage is reached, in this case negative 55 milliamps, sodium ions are allowed into the cell because the voltage-gated sodium channels open up. Then, when a certain voltage is reached, the potassium voltage-gated ion channels open and potassium ions are allowed out of the cell, which allows the neuron to reach its resting potential once again. Ligand-gated ion channels are very common in the synapses, and ligand-gated ion channels mean that a certain ligand is required to bind to the channel before the channel can open and allow its target molecule in. For example, the neurotransmitter GABA can bind to a certain type of ligand-gated ion channel in the postsynaptic membrane, and this can allow chloride ions to enter. Therefore, GABA is the ligand for the chloride ligand-gated ion channel. Enzyme-linked receptors are proteins that display enzymatic activity in response to binding a certain ligand. These enzyme-linked receptors usually have three domains. The first is the membrane-spanning domain. The membrane-spanning domain is deep within the membrane and helps anchor the protein to the membrane to ensure that it doesn't float away. The second is the ligand-binding domain. The ligand-binding domain is on the outside of the cell, and in this picture, it binds insulin. So insulin is the ligand. When the ligand binds to the ligand-binding domain, a conformational change occurs in the protein and then the catalytic domain is able to do its job. Many times, the catalytic domain will activate a second messenger cascade. So in this image, insulin is the first messenger, which means that insulin delivers the message from outside the cell to the ligand binding domain. Then a second messenger is released, which sends the message throughout the inside of the cell itself. An important class of membrane receptors are the G-protein coupled receptors. These are named because they utilize a G-protein, which is capable of binding GTP and hydrolyzing it to GDP. It's easy to spot a G-protein coupled receptor because they'll have seven membrane-spanning alpha helices. G-protein coupled receptors have alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. The alpha subunit is the one that is capable of binding GTP. When the alpha subunit binds GDP, it's in the inactive form, and so in the inactive form, it is bound to the beta and gamma subunits. When the alpha subunit binds GTP, it dissociates from the beta and gamma subunits and connects to an enzyme, which elicits a certain response. This response is important because it can either stimulate a certain signaling pathway or it can inhibit the pathway. So the activation of a G-protein coupled receptor doesn't always mean that a pathway will become more active. It can become more deactivated. Chapter 3.3 is about protein isolation. In order to isolate a particular protein to study, first the cell must be lysed, or the membrane must be broken open, 
and the contents have to be homogenized, which means that they have to be crushed, ground, or blended into an evenly mixed solution. Then the contents are centrifuge, which separates by density. Electrophoresis is an important technique in protein isolation. Electrophoresis is typically done on a gel where all of the samples of interest are placed on the starting line. Then an electric field is applied and the distance that a certain protein travels down the gel is determined based on its charge and its size. The migration velocity of a specific protein is determined by this equation V equals EZ over F. V is the migration velocity, E is the strength of the electric field, Z is the charge of the protein of interest, and F is the frictional coefficient, which depends on the mass and the shape of the migrating protein. Electrophoresis is typically done in polyacrylamide gel. One type of electrophoresis is called native page, which separates the proteins based off of only mass and charge. SDS page, on the other hand, separates based off of mass only, because SDS is a substance that disrupts all non-covalent um, interactions. So ionic interactions are disrupted, and SDS page works based off of mass only. Another type of electrophoresis is called isoelectric focusing, which is based off of the PI of the protein. We discussed how to calculate the PI or the isoelectric point of a protein in chapter one and how isoelectric focusing works is that the entire gel is made in a gradient from increasing to decreasing pH and a protein will migrate to where it is the most neutral or it will migrate to its isoelectric point on the gel. Another method that's commonly used to separate a protein of interest is known as chromatography. Here I've drawn a classic column chromatography setup. First you have your solid phase, also known as your stationary phase or your adsorbent. This is commonly made of silica or alumina beads. Your sample of interest is loaded up here and it's dissolved in the mobile phase or the solvent or the eluent. And this liquid will travel down through the stationary phase at varying speeds, depending on how polar it is or what the size is. So the retention time is how long a particular protein remains in the stationary phase. Elution is the word for when the protein of interest exits the column and into the collection vesicle. And partitioning is the process in which these different proteins travel down at different speeds and therefore they're separated. In ion exchange chromatography, the beads or the, or the particles of the stationary phase are charged. So substances of the opposite charge are held on to the column longer and substances that are the same charge as the stationary phase will travel through much faster. Size exclusion chromatography is a type of chromatography in which beads have very small pores in them, and so very small substances will go through the pores, which slows them down. However, larger molecules will go around the beads, which allows them to travel much faster. This can seem kind of counterintuitive, um, as you would expect larger molecules to travel slower. However, the fact that smaller molecules are able to go through the beads actually slows them down. Affinity chromatography is very specific. In affinity chromatography, you can attach specific receptors to the outside of your beads, which allows very specific proteins to attach onto the beads and all the other proteins to pass through. Chapter 3.4 is about protein analysis. The most common method of protein analysis is X-ray crystallography. In order for a protein to be analyzed with X-ray crystallography, it must first be isolated using one of the procedures I described previously, and then it must be crystallized. X-ray crystallography is a very common method in order to yield the structure of a particular protein. Another method is NMR spectroscopy, which you should be familiar with from organic chemistry. The amino acid sequence or the amino acid composition of a protein 
can be yielded using Edmund degradation. Edmund degradation is a process that cleaves amino acids one by one from the N terminus, and this can sequence polypeptides that are up to 50 or 70 amino acids long. If you have a longer protein, it must first be digested using chymotrypsin, trypsin, and cyanogen bromide. This can break up a longer protein into smaller fragments that can be analyzed with Edmund degradation. The activity level of a particular sample of protein can be calculated by reacting it with a given concentration of substrate and then comparing the activity level to that of an already known standard. The concentration of this sample of protein can be calculated using either UV spectroscopy or a Bradford protein assay. UV spectroscopy is very helpful in calculating the exact concentration of a protein because the absorbance at a particular wavelength is correlated to the concentration of protein. A Bradford protein assay utilizes a specific blue dye that starts out protonated and green-brown when it is alone. However, when this dye is added to a, um, a solution of protein, the protons in the dye start to react with the amino acids and the dye begins to turn blue. The higher the concentration of protein in the sample, the more blue the Bradford dye becomes. This is the end of chapter 3, and as always, thank you so much for watching.